maybe we, we shall begin. So the next talk uh, is a uh, talk of uh, Alba Yodash, and she will talk of uh, Aris theorem and uh, its applications to some kinetic and bias requirements. Thank you for the introduction, and I would like to thank the organizers for this opportunity. So today yeah, I'm going to talk about some Aris theorem, which is a couple of results concerning the uh, convergence of Markov processes. And we are going to see some applications of this theorem into some linear kinetic equations and, if time permits, some biological models. So it's like there is, I mean, it's only my name here, but it's a series of works with, uh, done in collaboration with several people. I'm going to mention them later. So, uh, oops. Uh, so first, there will be some introduction and the explanation of the theorem. And um, then uh, we are going to consider linear uh, BGK operator and linear Boltzmann equation. And uh, we are going to see how this theorem is applied to uh, those kind of equations to get the hypercursivity result. And then um, there are two more models coming from structured population dynamics. So this kind of things apply to those kind of models as, as well, um, if they are represented in a stochastic way. So we are going to see those. So first of all, um, so what, what's this like um, in, in Harris's theorem? It's like the, uh, it's first uh, um, developed for the discrete time Markov processes. Discrete time Markov process is nothing but a collection of set of random variables uh, on some states if you write it like this uh, and will be defined here and the, this is on a space space let's say omega and these are the uh, set of random variables omega values random variables right so this omega can be uh, anything like it can be a finite set or it can be in the case of uh, linear kinetic equations, we will take it as the uh, RD um, coupled with either torus or RDRD, or it can be some Hilbert space, or like it can be anything. So let's look at when it is when the in the case of finite set. So we have let's say some um, variable states, let's say J. So um, if we like uh, define the Markov process which has a uh, starting distribution uh, as i and this can be described as some um, row vector like probability vector uh, which is a row vector whose entries are greater than or equal to zero and they sum up to one and the distribution uh, after uh, some time and time let's say can be defined as, let's say, n plus sometimes, if, uh, if it, the state has the distribution uh, j at uh, n plus one time, given that it has uh, some i n at n times, can be represented by a ma matrix. So this is a transition probability matrix which has again the non, uh, great, uh, the all entries are greater than or equal to zero and all rows sum up to one like all the compartments so then um, we have the like distribution uh, of our Markov process after n time is nothing but the uh, uh, new uh, uh, take uh, mu times and pm, which is the transition matrix. So like, if we have the finite state space, and at some time, if we have positive probability of transitioning from one step to another random state, positive, like if this probability is positive, like, and if we, if we let the process run long enough, it's natural to, think that, natural to think that this process will stabilize, right? Because there are like finitely many states. Anyway, all these states are going to get visited, especially the one which has the positive probability of 
getting into that state. So then in that case, the distribution of um, mu times pn will be independent from the initial data, like it, initial distribution will be forgotten. Then um, in that case, like we have, we will have the, um, if we write it like this, for example, So for m time large enough, this in distribution will be something like this, right? So then um, by the uh, Cauchy convergence, this, this will have a limit when n goes to infinity, and that limit will be the, um, will be the equilibrium of this Markov process, let's say. So these were the ideas of Dublin, uh, which goes back to 1940s, and uh, this is in fact the Markov uh, not the reference to the paper, it's the, uh, the oops. Okay. Ah, okay. So this is the birth year to year of Dublin and this is the death year. He has a, a bit tragic story, so we got to know about his research. Many years later he died. So then these these were the ideas of Dublin in the finite state space. So then um, we go a little bit back. Then these people, um, they use this Dublin's theorem in a non-quantitative setting to prove convergence to equilibrium for scattering equations with non-equilibrium steady states. And then uh, in the 1956 paper, Harris mentioned that the conditions of uh, having uh, existence and universe of a steady state for a Markov process. Then uh, later on in this paper, these people they using by using these ideas, they showed how can they prove how can we show this exponential convergence to equilibrium in, in for a Markov process. And then also there is some book, book here. I yes, I forward it to the road by two, I think two thousand. And that, there also it's mentioned. And then uh, so in two thousand eleven. Uh, it is used for proving the convergence to equilibrium for kinetic copper plant equation in a non quantitative way. And then uh, this is the uh, kind of uh, the result why we were interested in, in the beginning because Hire and Mattingly they um, simplified the proofs of these things um, by using trans uh, transport mass distances and they gave like the conditions like of having quantitative rates, obtaining quantitative rates to convergence of equilibrium once we uh, verified the assumptions in a quantitative way. So then uh, in 2016, uh, these people, they used Dublin's theorem and get these quantitative rates of convergence for some nonlinear kinetic equations on the torus. And yeah, so this is kind of short maybe introduction. Then uh, we have our setting, like I will skip these things, maybe it's annoying for many of you, but then we have the, uh, our measurable space. This omega would be the state space, like first, like we, will, we are going to take it as something either like this, or RB and RB, or like later on we will take it to be as a polished space so that it is nice, separable, um, complete and separable metric space. And then when this measurable space is um, equipped with uh, probability measures, um, then it is like a nice Banach space, right? So then these are some more definitions. And then, so we define this here, the continuous time mark of processes we are going to consider. Then uh, we define this transition probability function. It is very similar to transition probability matrix, like in this case it will be like probability of ending up as like, let's say, uh, ending up in some state where if we, given that we started um, at x, let's say, state x will be equal to in this setting um, x and x comma a, so it's like the then the for every element in the state space, it's it's a probability measure, 
and for every uh, subset of the uh, board, sigma borel al algebra, it is a measurable function. So then uh, we can define by this uh, t mm, transition probability mm, function, via this transition probability function, we define our stochastic operator we are going to consider later on. Here it's uh, defined acting on the uh, finite measures in this way, and then it's acting on the bounded measurable functions in the following way. In fact, like it's the one of them is, is dual of other, but now I'm abusing the notation a bit and I'm using the same uh, for both of them. Then, uh, then we have the continuous time Markov process, then we, uh, here the time variable will be con continuous, of course, then it will be represented by the um, semi-group, so it's given here like this, and it will satisfy the semi-group property, and the P at time zero is the identity, and then in our setting, uh, Pt mu will be the a solution to the PT, PDE operation we consider later on with the initial vacuum unit. So, yeah. And then this is the Dobbins condition in a mathematical statement, let's say. If we have our um, stochastic semi group and uh, it's defined through a mark of transition probability, and then after some time uh, there is some probability distribution and uh, which we no matter where we start from, we have the uh, we can bound this uh, the distribution after some time by some positive distribution times some constant, right? It's like a kind of a bound for transitioning from um, one uh, step to one one step from one state to another state in a with a positive. Um, distribution, right? So it's like um, if we have this, if we can prove something like this for every part of the state space, like um, not in a not in a not in a set, but like for uniformly on the whole state space, then it is called the this condition. But then we cannot do it all the time, right? So then, if we can prove this kind of property on just for some bounded. Uh, part of state space, and then uh, we try to um, kind of control the like if we if we have the if we have a stochastic process which can um, drift arbitrarily far away, then we, we need to have another condition to converge to that state space all the time, right? Then we will need another condition, the open of condition. So basically, that is the Harris's theorem. Which is applied to the like it, which is the Dobbins theorem, but applied to unbounded state space. So yeah. Uh, anyway, so it was the next thing. But then, if we have the this Dobbins Dobbins condition satisfied, we have the by the like with this idea and the, by the construction, we will have um, the convergence rate to equilibrium here. The for uh, two measures, we will have this kind of inequality, mm -hmm. and then uh, we will have the unit equilibrium of the uh, Markov process, and then we will have the co exponential convergence rate is also given by the uh, by uh, the constants in the in the theorem, right? In the condition, uh, the Dobbins condition. Yeah. So this is uh, for like yeah this we, if we can prove this minorization condition in uniformly in the whole like on the state space we, we will have this kind of uh, result but if we cannot prove it on the whole state space but some part of the state space then we will have a, we will require extra condition which is called Lyapunov uh, condition so it is it says that uh, like there is a function um, like the defined in the positive real part and then some constants and we can try to bond the semi group after some time acting on this function via these uh, again the um, some uh, constant times the function and, and a constant so in our um, 
continuous setting, continuous time setting, which will be equal to showing this kind of uh, equality, inequality, sorry. So uh, when f is the solution to the PD or kinetic equation we are going to consider later, and uh, we, how do we do this? It's like we try to show something like this in the last line. So if you okay, if you um, multiply this thing, with the uh, a to the power lambda t, and then if you uh, take the derivative of it, you you will get at the end something like this. So it, it's the if this is equivalent to say that like fit part is equivalent to say true for let's say in a continuous time setting. So um, yes. So then if we have the Diagonal condition we, which will uh, control the um, process outside this bounded set and in this bounded set we can reach every part of this bounded set via this uh, Dublin like local Dublin like condition which is give this set the uh, the boundaries of the set like how big the set is given by the uh, constants coming from the Diagonal conditions condition here. Yeah. So having these two properties satisfied is going to give us uh, the theorem. So first of all, like I, I just wrote here the how we define the uh, distance on two probability measures. Like it is in, in like you can think it as a, a total variation norm or L1 norm, whichever you consider the space, like it is uh, the stochastic semigroup either is a linear um, functions defined from measure space to another measure space or from L1 to another L1 space. So, or it's like uh, the, it can be, you can take this as a, okay, should be beta here, as a weighted supreme norm. So, uh, then if we have satisfied this diagonal and local building condition, we are going to have some, some result like this, like the buildings. And then uh, this constant will be also depending on the pre constants on the um, our um, as hypothesis assumptions, and then you can uh, iterate this and get for uh, okay no this is already for yeah for all times. So th this is the basically setting. I mean just to just if we repeat like it's Harris's theorem is like kind of. Um, establishing a combination of uh, um, minorization and drift com condition, right? This minorization condition is like um, transitioning, probability of transitioning from one step to another step with the, like, uh, if we have this as a positive probability, then th this will be the minorization condition. And if we cannot prove it in the uniform in the whole state space, we need to have another condition to converge into that that part of the state space where, where we have the minorization condition. So for to do that, we need a Lyapunov condition and we need to prove that. So if we have these things satisfied, then we will have the Harris's theorem, and which will give the unique equilibrium and also exponential convergence rate. So, um, okay. So these, this version is based on the lectures, not, not so higher. So the notes are called convergence of mark processes. So then uh, there in those notes also they have a version of the theorem for weaker potentials, right? Um, so this will apply only for the case when we consider linear kinetic equations. I just wrote for the sake of completeness, but if we basically if it, it says that if we have the weak potential to um, keep our process drift away, like if, it, if the potential is weak, weak, then we will have, of course, we won't have, of course, this exponential convergence, we will have sub-exponential convergence, and that's what this theorem gives, and uh, it states the conditions of, of having this kind of rate. 
uh, okay, so uh, it says that, okay, with the infinitesimal generator of our Markov uh, process, and we, if we have a, like, a continuous function with the pre-compact level set satisfying this kind of property, this kind of thing, and then um, for a uh, phi concave, strictly con concave and increasing to infinity, then also if we have a minorization condition uh, in a set, in a bound, bounded field uh, like this, then uh, <coughs> we are going to give the rate by some another primitive functions defined in this way. So we are, yeah, so now we are going to see how this, this theorem can be applied to uh, linear, some linear kinetic equations first. This, first. this, is, this part is a joint work with my PhD supervisor, Jose Caniso, and uh, Chuki Kao from Paris Dauphin, and Josephine, who is here, also from uh, Paris Dauphin. So, uh, in this part, we consider the equations of this type, right? Either posed in torus or in the whole state space. In that case, we will have a potential here. And the L is acting only on the weather speed variable. So it will be also the generator of the semi group. And uh, L will be, we will only interested in two cases here, like when L is the Bo uh, linear BGK operator or the linear Boltzmann operator, the phi is the containing potential. Yes, so then uh, if we first consider uh, linear BGK, in, uh, posed in the whole, sta uh, whole domain like RD, uh, we will assume that this um, uh, combining potential is growing like quadratically at infinity, and uh, this L operator will be defined in the, with the positive part here, uh, in this way, like um, M is the max value. So this is like a toy model, like sim simple kinetic equations, let's say, and which will have the equilibrium max value anyway. So uh, if we consider the equation in the torus, of course we will get rid of the uh, potential part, and yeah, it will be uh, defined in this way. So of, of course there are so many um, references, I just uh, wrote some of them here also, it was mentioned in the previous talk as well, like uh, how these uh, hypercoercivity techniques um, developed um, by Villani and Euro. And so here these people and they show that this uh, for the linear VGK equation, they show this convergence to equilibrium in H1 setting at uh, it is faster than like linear. And then in the this uh, paper, 2015 paper, they use the um, most linear L2 setting. So and so, and the linear Boltzmann equation in the RD plus RD will be the defined similarly with the collision operator on the right hand side, which will be defined in the, uh, decomposed in this way. And uh, if we have the if we have the equation posed on torus, we we won't have the uh, potential here. So this will describe the uh, particle of um, the dynamics of particle of dust particles interacting with the medium, uh, some environment which is already uh, in the equilibrium, the max failure. So uh, here the of course like Q will be the Boltzmann operator, and then B is the collision kernel. We always assume that this is a hard kernel where. Uh, which can be decomposed into like uh, to this and then gamma will be greater than or equal to zero and we also assume that this b um, will be integrable in sigma and also it is um, bounded so also I, I wrote some uh, some of the works on this equation from among many others and yeah so how we apply this Hertz's theorem into these kind of um, equations. 
So uh, we have first uh, our theorem on the in torus. On the torus, we have the exponential convergence, of course, which okay when t is the solution to uh, either like linear BGK or linear Boltzmann equation, um, and with the initial data in probability space, and then we we have like there is some constants, and then. Uh, the convergence is the exponential, and uh, in the case of linear BGK, the convergence is given by the total variation norm. In the case of uh, linear Boltzmann equation, it, it, this is the weighted total variation, weight, like weight is here. So the idea how we prove this kind of thing, first, um, yeah. So. For the linear BGK, first we, we consider only the transport part. Let's say, yeah, this uh, TT is uh, solving this uh, transport part of this, so we can write it in this way. And then if you use Donald's formula several times, you can bound, you can write these solutions are bounded by this and you like he, here this this will be the pure transport operator and L plus is the kind of jump operator, positive jump operator. So to show the uh, Durbin like minorization condition, only th only thing we need to do is to give a bound for this part, right? This thing. So to do that we need of course a bound on uh, L part, L plus part first and uh, transport part. So in this, uh, like this will be the general strategy for the later on. I am not going to details for the others. So for in this case for a um, jump in the, the bound for the jump operator, uh, we will allow jumps uh, any to any velocity which are small. So which will be given by this lemma. And here, if we consider this uh, for like any for any small velocity. So here, if we consider this alpha L to be the max value of um, delta L, this, this, um, this lemma will be proved. So then, uh, for the transport part, okay, so then here, like, we assume our state space as ball now, like, also in the beginning for uh, jump operator, but so here we have the state space as a ball, uh, we consider a ball, and then um, here we, we say that, like this ball of radius r, we start in, in, at any place with any small velocity, we say that we can reach all, all parts of this ball. ball. So this uh, lemma, t lemma, will be given that basically. So given any time, given a time, t0, and a radius r for the ball, we start from this sigma l, like with the velocity at sigma l, bounded with, uh, with sigma l, and uh, we can reach so any part of this ball with, with this kind of bound. So it's like um, you see here uh, what this transport operator. So we at the position we are at x zero in the beginning. And with a bounded velocity, so this transport sends it to which will move in velocity a bit, and then um, uh, which will move a bit, but the velocity will not change, right? This is So if we, so this transport will turn it into like this, and then if we integrate this um, in V, then uh, we do a couple of change of variables, and we will prove this kind of uh, bond for the transport operator, and the combination of these two lemmas will uh, give us the bond for this thing, and then we in the case of a linear BGK equation, which is like very simple. We don't even need to use Harris's theorem, so we can uh, prove uh, this kind of minorization condition. 
uh, uniformly, like on the whole state space, so then uh, we will have the uh, convergence result. And for the linear Boltzmann equation, uh, we will have a, we will follow a bit, a bit different strategy. And um, yeah, so we we will write this uh, right hand side in the this following way, and um, the where, where sigma is bounded, it will behave like um, uh, gamma power of b. So yeah, so it's just just this much I wrote for the linear Boltzmann case. Oh, but, Aren't you on the torus? Yes, it's we are all on the torus. Yeah. No, aren't on the torus. Yes, this this was just for result for the torus. Yeah. So yeah, now I will go into it partly. Because this kind of this kind of computation which you just showed there, that's kind of dispersion estimates for free transport. Right? Uh, sorry. Dispersion estimates for free transport. Uh, no, it's just yeah, it's like this. Uh, here, right? So the transport operator, what I take is this solution to uh, only the transport part. So it's like, let's say, x0. So it's just the, it, it just says that like we are in the, uh, we are at some part in the ball, part, uh, so with a bounded velocity. And if we apply the transport operator, we just move somewhere with the same velocity didn't change. So it's, it's just that. Yeah. Yeah, because you had this radius r and you already told us that's a different Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so now we are going to go to the RD. And in RD, of course, we have the combining potential. And we, we assume that combining potential is growing like quadratically at infinity. And uh, for also linear Boltzmann equation, we will assume that the hard, uh, hard kernel and uh, B is bounded, like, uh, yeah, this extra couple of assumptions coming uh, for the bound for the uh, combining potential. Then we again will have the Convergence, exponential convergence result uh, there the, to the unit equilibrium, which is Maxwellian. And then uh, this uh, for the um, weighted um, total variation distance will be weighted by this kind of thing. Yeah, so for the idea of proof in the, okay, for these cases, of course, we will need to use the Harris's theorem. So the, for the minorization condition, we we have we will have the assumption of having we are allowing to produce large velocities under the action of uh, sigma here. Like it's it will be like we will consider a um, solution to ODE with the action of this potential, and then for the Lyapunov case, we we this kind of um, <coughs> function will satisfy the assumption like which is. Easy to verify. This. Let's see. So we try to show this kind of thing, right? It, when we plug the that kind of open function into this this kind of uh, framework, so we, we will have uh, this kind of inequality, and the open condition will be satisfied. Yeah. So yes. So like. Okay. So for the linear Boltzmann case, so this Lyapunov part has challenges a bit, like you need to control the mo moments of this potential, right? Like they should behave in a good way. Here in this case, uh, we can we have only result for this Maxwell molecules. It's not like um, for greater than zero. Probably there is a way to do for greater than zero as well, but it, uh, uh, this uh, computations get a bit messy. So, yes. So this is the subgeometric case, but I think I will just skip this part. It says that if the, if the potential is weak, uh, so that it's, it has a, um, it's growing like in a sub-quadratic way, then we will have a convergence rate, which is less than exponential, of course, it's, which will be algebraic, will be, in the case of linear VGK, it will be given 
by minimum of these two two rates, and then for the case of uh, linear Boltzmann equation, which will be given by this, and then I put some uh, so for yeah they like we here we give some quantitative rates right like um, even though they are not okay they are slower than uh, exponential so but like in the uh, literature there are not many quantitative um, results for this kind of case there is this uh, work of these people but for the linear uh, for the kin kin kinetic focal Planck equation so as a like conclusion so we will have we obtained by Harris's theorem so exponential convergence rates for the uh, on the torus or in the whole space uh, on in the whole space with a confining potential growing quadratically at infinity and we will we have this algebraic convergence rate for the subquadratic potential weaker potentials so yeah I, I don't know if there there are any quantitative results in that case uh, and we give uh, this and our results in total variation norms either or the weighted total variation norms of course if you consider the L1 space then it will be equal to L1 or weighted L1 norms and which will allow us to uh, include a um, more wider range of initial conditions with including measure initial data with very bad local regularity so it gives of course like the existence of stationary solution without uh, knowing many details on it, like it just gives the existence. So of course it has the drawbacks as well, now I'm, I didn't write them here much, but these rates are not optimal at all, so okay, there are some, and also the, there, is a, there is not a uniform way to apply this to every kind of equation, right? For every, every kind of equation you need to change your strategy for at least for the, uh, at, for the Dublin part. So then, uh, yes, so now I have a bit of time to talk about how we can apply these kind of results into um, equations like models coming from population dynamics. And it, this is a joint work with my PhD supervisor. So it's applied to the neuron population models structured by elapsed time. So, um, okay, uh, here also I wrote a bit of um, history for um, biological applications of this Harris's theorem. So there are many more than this, of course. But yeah, like uh, first, the one, first one we came across was the was done for the renewal equation by Pierre Gabriel, and then there are series of works for uh, different kind of models. And then uh, here, the model we are considered is the describing the evolution of the uh, neuron population at time t at state s. So s is defined as the time passed since last discharge. The neurons will have a behavior of like um, they will charge, like they will charge in some time, and then suddenly they will discharge, and they will charge, and they will discharge. This this kind of behavior is kind of stochastic, right, in a way. So. Uh, yeah, so here P will be the firing rate. So when they discharge, they will fire to, yeah, they will fire. And we will have the uh, boundary condition says that the neurons after fire, they enter this state, like enter the state again. They start from zero, basically they, they are reborn. So that's why it is called H structure. So capital N of T will be the flux of neurons which are discharging at time t. Also it is the global activity. So um, yeah and yeah. So in the this model was introduced by Patan and Salor 2010 paper, but they here it's not so much seen but here they use a different notation. This P is uh, of course depend I mean this is a like as you notice it's a nonlinear model because of the, due to the dependence of P on, on time T, right? So here, the global activity of neurons uh, depends on the flux of neurons which are discharging in, in this way. So this alpha, uh, they consider it some, uh, sometimes like this alpha is considered as delay here, like we won't consider in our case, but I, I just wrote how they introduced this model 
to say that, like this is the J is the network connectivity. This model has like very interesting behavior. So for for example, J is equal to two. There is one unique equilibrium, and this is the flux of neurons which uh, are having discharge at time t, right? So it goes to equilibrium after some time. And when J is here 3.5, again the same kind of behavior. But if we had J2, for example, in these simulations, there is an oscillatory behavior. So also there is another paper by these people in 2013. They quantified the regime where these kind of things happen, where it has only one equilibrium, where in which part it has it will have oscillatory behavior. So in our case, of course, we are interested. We want to apply to this apply this Harris theorem or the Dunning's theorem in that case, this case. So we are only interested in the place uh, in in the in in the case with very weak very weak nonlinearity, very weak connectivity. Let's say in this case. So okay. So this is the first model, and the second model is a little bit of modification of the first one with this integral term on the right hand side. Uh, this gives an um, effect of a memory effect to the neurons. Like here, uh, they they fire. After firing, they don't start from zero. They wait a bit and they start from some some state which is close to zero. So this right hand side gives that kind of effect, and uh, which is also has this uh, boundary condition zero. And then this kernel gives the distribution of neurons which take the state S when they discharge at time U, right? So, yeah. Let's say like this. So if we consider this kernel as the that function at S, then we recover the first model. So um, properties of this model, it's like mass, mass conservative, it preserves positivity, and then if we take the initial data as, a data as a probability measure, of course, it's, since it's mass conservative, it will be always a probability measure. And then, um, so if we take, like here, this firing rate, uh, if we take, we will consider the executor ne network, which means that if uh, many neurons fire, it will make easier for other neurons also fire. So this, this uh, derivative with respect to uh, global activity of neurons will be greater than zero. Yeah, so this is not there in the first one. So um, we will have the couple of assumptions. So we will assume that this firing rate is a Lipschitz function. So here, like since we changed the model a bit in the first one, uh, we have we put all the connectivity in this Lipschitz constant. So we, this will, of course, be bounded by some things later on, we will see. So also for firing rate, we assume some uh, lower and upper bounds, uh, starting from some uh, non-zero time, let's say. So then uh, we, we have, we make this assumption also, it's coming from the, uh, the original model. And then uh, for the kappa, we will assume that it is a, a positively bounded measure, like supported on zero u, and the integral with respect to s will be one. So, uh, if we have these assumptions, then we will have the uh, we will we will have unique equilibrium by using uh, Dublin's theorem and uh, exponential convergence to that equilibrium. And uh, of course, these these constants are like all coming from the s. Uh, Dublin's condition satisfied, and then this smallness assumption on L will be written by something like this, which is also coming from calculation, which doesn't look so nice. But then the idea of the proof, since it's a nonlinear model, it's a bit like different. So we can apply this kind of thing to linear um, positivity and mass preserving semi groups, right? So first we consider the uh, we, cons we find the positive lower bound for the linear equation, then uh, of course it will mean that the condition is satisfied and the bound we find will be, be uniform, for, uh, will be okay for all parts of the uh, domain. Then if we have the Dublin conditions, we will have the 
this spectral gap in the linear of course setting, then we will use some kind of perturbation argument uh, to get the exponential relaxation to stationary solution. So the thing is here that like we can only get a result for very weak nonlinearity, right? Like since we use this perturbation argument, so it's not very non it's not really very nonlinear. Okay, that I will not maybe mention these details of the proofs like for the linear case, nonlinear case. So the last thing I will mention a bit is also with joint joint with my PhD supervisor and Pierre Gabriel from Versailles. So this is this part is still a uh, work in progress, so it, which will be out soon probably. So this is like an, another structured population dynamics model, where the cells are uni, like where, where the population consists of uni, uni uh, cellular organisms. So then elapsed time or age will not really make any sense. In that set, in that setting, we will um, we will take the structuring variable as some mass of cell or some some amount of some certain proteins or DNA, DNA content or length of cell or whatever is really relevant here. We will consider it as like this, and then these these kind of things has of course like may, many applications like in cell division polymerization, neurosciences, or like these primes, and even in some telecommunication uh, networks, these kind of equations get used, and some applications in ecology as well. So there are a <coughs> huge amount of previous work, which I didn't write. So there are like, let's, if we get to some properties of these type of equations, then the, uh, okay, here, I didn't mention here, the of, uh, N is the, uh, population density with time t at uh, with the structuring variable x, like let's say size x here. So g is the growth rate, uh, population growth with this rate, and then uh, kappa will be the fragmentation, and it like it gets uh, it gets fragmented by this this part, and then b is the total fragmentation rate. So in this model, like when B is constant, then we know that the mass is conserved, but not necessarily in the other type of B. So, okay, here, okay, so uh, yeah, it's the growth rate, and then uh, we, will, we will write B uh, in terms of uh, fragmentation kernel by this, this way, so that we get the mass conservation, and uh, not mass conservation, but the conservation of the right hand side, uh, the operator which is describing the right hand side of the equation, let's say. So in this work, we consider only two types of kernel, which is one of them is equal mitosis of this shape, and then, echo, then the equation becomes something like this. Uh, and then on the, another one is the uniform fragmentation, which is like constant fragmentation, basically. So, um, yes. So then, uh, to like first thing to study uh, for getting this uh, convergence rate to equilibrium for these kind of equations, to look at this eigenvalue problem, right? So this is the associated eigenvalue problem. If we can find this such a triple, then we will know that uh, equation will converge to the equilibrium whose shape will be given by this eigenfunction and which the rate will be lambda. But not, this is not easy for, like, you cannot prove the existence of these, these things where, where the equation gets very complicated. So, uh, okay, if we have this, um, then if we have these eigenelements, then we can scale the equation and write it like this, and we, we, work, we make our calculations on this, uh, like here, like to, it's because it is simpler, and we can easily recover the properties of the first one by studying this one. Uh, yes, so um, yeah, here the equilibrium will be capital N. So uh, only conserved, like only conserved quantity here, this one we are sure of, like if of course B is one, 
mass is also conserved. But then, uh, yeah, so what we, uh, okay, so the, what is interesting here, when the g of x is equal to x, um, and when we consider the mitosis kernel, there is not a single positive eigenvalue. There is, instead, there is a set of eigenvalues, like it, it is uh, also investigated in this paper. So then, uh, the equation will have oscillatory behavior in that case. Um, and so this, oh, that's why we will uh, treat this case in a different way in the proofs. So uh, another thing is that the, the assumptions we make are these ones, like um, which are maybe looser than the ones like the, made in the previous work. So under these conditions and assumptions, uh, we will have the, okay, I, I didn't write the final result, we will have the uh, convergence rate to equilibrium by using the Harris's theorem. Yeah, so that's the, yeah, that I didn't, do, I, I guess I forgot to put the final theorem slide, but yeah, this is the, uh, this will be the, oh, I think, yeah, thank you. Like for for example, on the whole state space, we have this kind of bound for, of course, the derivative of the potential. It's in in most the derivative of the potential in this way. And in other other directions, so you said that sub subcolumbicity is difficult, so you do not get uh, exponential potential. Yes, because the potential is weak, weaker than in the quadratic. In the L two theory, it is allowed. To for the weak, the weak potentials. Yes, so the problem that is where you are sublinear. Yes, then. Between linear and quadratic, essentially, you don't 
social you can find it. Okay, I, 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 I don't know of those things with uh, maybe and um, so why why is there in square just in the middle? This is a technical assumption. This is this it's square. Here. Yes. Yeah, it's because the um, the it's uh, because the Lyapunov function we will use uh, is of this form, so which will need involve some derivatives here uh, in uh, the x dv uh, to able to satisfy this kind of condition, right? Uh, here, this we want to basically have, have an inequality on the moments of this potential, like involving the potential. So, yeah, that's the... That's the Any other question? Sure. Uh, Leopold condition you want to work with. So you have computed this function V only for the Maxwellian molecules? Mm -hmm. so for, for the... Uh, for the uh, this, uh, yeah, on RD, yes. Yeah. Have you worked out for the Ram Maxwell case? Uh, how would you guys find that? I mean, we tried, I think, right? But, uh, yeah, we have something written somewhere. <laughs> but we have some weird conditions. I don't remember. Like, you have so to have, if you have a strong enough uh, confining potential in terms of, so if you have a really big gamma, then you also need like much stronger than quadratic confinement potential for outside of the open of functions to work. I don't think we put this in the text though because it's a kind of weird. Uh, and probably it's not really optimal. Yeah. I think in the week conference we gave you told me that some uh decay. Is the power optimal? Uh, no, I don't think so. Maybe. Uh, no, really. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the constant probably with the. Uh, the this. Oh, okay. You the thing that is complicated is there's some trade off between the weights you put in your norm and the rate of decay. Yeah. This is where you can get decay, exponential decay down to a low weaker confining potential with weight you get some expression. So it's not really clear, like, what you should. To me, it's not, not really clear how you should optimize. So we have like uh, quadratic weights in our, in, in our thing, and in that case, I think probably uh, we don't prove that it's optimal, but maybe it is. You just need to find some moment that's behaving badly, which is good sometimes. Of course, too. There are some uh, results for just a um, like kinetic Fokker blank. Oh, sorry, not kinetic, just the straight Fokker blank, and then they get the same kind of rates as us. And that is optimal, you can show that's optimal. Uh, but that's a, I mean, a much simpler, different model. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.